Hi, welcome to Clitterly Speaking, the podcast. I'm Michelle Doherty. And I'm Emily Lane. We are BFFs dedicated to bringing you conversations between girlfriends over a bottle of wine. Oh, I am so excited about the wine part. Oh, me too. So pull up a chair, grab your glass, and let's get talking. Hey, 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 Emily, how are you today? Hey, 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 Michelle. I'm doing pretty good. I'm good. Awesome. Yeah, how about oh, yeah. you? I'm you just had a birthday. I did. I did. The birthday was on Saturday and I was, uh, yeah, I'm just a little older. I actually, mm-hmm. today I was filling out a survey and I, I now moved up into the next category. <laughs> oh, category. <laughs> Before, how did that feel? Well, you know, I, after I picked myself off off the floor and uh, wiped my tears and, uh, <laughs> you know, I drank a, drank a bottle of wine, I thought, you know, I'm fine now. But I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Moved out of that, you know, I'm now in the 51 to 60 category oh, on the yes. one survey. When just Friday, I was in the 40, whatever, to to 50. Mm-hmm. I was 41 to 50. So I'm a, I'm part wow. of the young group now. I'm yet I'm I'm the youngsters of the of the group as opposed to the old wise veteran. That's true. Of the 40s. So, and yeah. you know, with that extra year has come your ability to drink another bottle of wine. To right. get you through these movements and, you know, handle it well. And look <laughs> at you. You're still here and you can talk. And Yes, everything's yeah. good. Everything's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. yeah. Today, was a, today was a real fun day. Uh, spend a lot of time in the... Uh, in waiting in line at the post office, mailing packages oh to my my two older children uh, as I've been cleaning out the house and packing things up and mailing to them. But this was, you know, the first day really since like some things have changed in our state and it was like, it was a long time at the post office in line, socially distanced with masks and boxes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. But uh, other than that, it's good. And you, Emily? Yeah, I know it's, things are, things are good and I remain really busy and um, some really exciting projects that are developing and um, you know, it helps, it really helps me, you know, to, the fact that I have all of these projects that I'm cultivating, uh, just, it helps keep my mind out of the troubles of, you know, quarantine and, you know, we're starting to quarantine, you know, uh-huh. uh, which has been really nice. So I've been able to see Denise a couple of times and obviously I saw you for your birthday. So, um, socially distanced helpful. everybody who might oh, be concerned. We were definitely yes. appropriately social, so, socially distanced. Absolutely. And, and it was great because we were on my back deck and it was a beautiful day on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And um, it was glorious. Yeah. So I think that's, bottles that's of bubbly definitely later. Helping. Yeah. Uh, just a few. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, we celebrated appropriately. We did. So, we did. So yeah. speaking of celebrating and beverages. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, um, uh, yeah, let's, let's bring our guest on because I know that she has a glass of wine as well that she would, you know, we we'll get her to talk about her wine and, um, and then we'll, if, if it's okay with you, Emily, then we'll uh, chit chat about all of the wines we're drinking. Yeah, let's do yeah, it. Good. Good. So we are joined today by um, a friend, a neighbor, uh, a, a listener of the podcast, Ellen Kunkelman. And um, Ellen is in the book, it's in my book club. And I know her from the parish and I know her from the neighborhood. And I had posted this thing on Facebook um, about uh, watching Mrs. America. And I wasn't sure, it was really kind of hard. And I had mentioned after I had read it, I after I watched the first episode, I updated my post and Ellen responded that she had actually met Phyllis Schlafly when she was a member of the college conservatives. And I was like, what? <laughs> so much uh, information here. <laughs> and I was like, I would want to talk to you about that. And then somebody else who's a listener of... um of the post, of the, I'm sorry, of the podcast was like, I would love to hear that conversation. So I messaged Ellen. I said, would you like to come on and talk with us? And she said, sure. And so here we are welcoming Ellen Kunkelman to our podcast. Hello, episode. Michelle. Hi, Emily. Hi, nice to see you again. I'm really looking Likewise. forward to diving in a little deeper on this one. But, this conversation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, I I think it's going to be quite the quite an informative and fun and eye opening conversation. So, um, but before we get into like the real heart and meat of it, let's talk about our wines. The and wine part. Drinking. The wine. Yeah. Part. 
Well, I will kick us off. I am drinking a Beaujolais, uh, a Moulin au Vent, and this is made by a uh, domain Boulon, J. Boulon. It's a 2016. Um, I love wines from the Moulin au Vent. Like, I love that that part, the, the Beaujolais from there. Um, I, I, I This is... It's as lovely as I would have expected it to be. I'm getting on the nose um, some cherry, a little bit of strawberry. That comes through on the palate. It really makes me salivate when I take a sip. So there's some, you know, a little acidity going on there. Um, But what's kind of interesting is that, like, it has this nice little creaminess, like almost Mm. like a a triple cream cheese might. Mm. But then it finishes with some black pepper. So this is kind of got a lot going on. And I just opened it. So I'm excited to see how it develops. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, today I'm drinking a Cabernet Sauvignon Mm. from California. It is a, it's um, Clos de Napa. It's a, a Rutherford from the Rutherford family. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I have said to, oh, here's the picture. Uh, Oh yeah. I have have said to the guys at the wine merchant before that um, I like, I like wines that tell a story. And so I called up, you know, because that's how we we were doing it. I called up, I'm like, I'm looking for a wine that tells a story and the like $20 and under. And they said, then you have to go, you have to drink this Clos de Napa. And I, I, I saved it for today's episode. I just opened it up and it is amazing. I I didn't even want to drink it because the aroma is so Mm. wonderful. I just kept like sniffing it and being transported Mm. to like another location. And then when I took a sip, they were not kidding. This this is a beautiful Cabernet and... This is going to be a little different than from my normal, like if this were a panty, if this wine were a novelist, it would be a Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You know how his stories are like so intertwined and everything. This, this bottle, this glass just continues to tell the story. It's like, it's amazing. It's magic realism in a glass. I love it. Oh my God. I think I have a little wine envy over here. I, I, you, you, you should. And it's yeah. twenty and it's twenty dollars. He said you can't you cannot beat this. And I, I totally agree. I'm probably hey. gonna get another bottle tomorrow. Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. Mm. Ellen, what are you drinking? I'm drinking a rose today. It is um Cote de Rose. It is a Sin Salt blend blend and um it's dry, it's not too fruity, it's pleasant. And Sounds perfect. You can oh, get it's that also where pretty- I got it at Schnucks and it's also, okay. and it was like on the total, um, it's at available at Total Wine Merchant too. Yeah. Um, but it's the prettiest bottle. And I always just like to say that if you're looking for a gift for like a young lady in her early twenties, this would be a great one. It had a glass cork. Oh and yeah. There's a cut oh, the rose rosette. Oh, not, is this a rose? Nice. Yes. And it kind of made me think of high school, um, which is appropriate <laughs> considering what we're going to be talking about. And how maybe I would like put some dried roses from a play in a clearly Canadian bottle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a throwback. A little bit of a throwback for a sure. Um, uh, just a little, feeling a little classier than uh, necessarily in high school drink at the Canadian club, right? A little bit. Right. So awesome. The mad dog. That's what we drank when I was in high school. Mad dog. Uh, we drank wine coolers. Oh. In, high, in high school, not, I, I mean, I'm sorry, other people did, you know, in case I have family and children oh. listening, the other, <laughs> other people drank those. I just uh, watched it from the sidelines. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you had a drink? Me? Um, Either, I, both. Yeah, I was actually in, um, I was actually in college. I think it was my first weekend and it was, wait for it, Boone's Farm, Peach. Ah, yes. Yes. It was like $3. It was great. Yeah. Um, so the first time you drank was in college. It was. Wow. Um, it was partly because I lived out in the country and there was a lot of driving. Um, I didn't really wish to have a car accident. I thought yeah. I'd leave the drinking and driving to my younger brothers. They were successful. <laughs> <laughs> I I was probably, a, I mean, other than wine at the dinner table with, you know, with, with family and stuff like that at Thanksgiving or, you know, communion, um, I was probably a sophomore in high school. That's the first time I really remember like drinking to excess and 
getting in trouble and embarrassing myself, all of that. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, you know, I just got better at it as time went on. Right. What about you, Emily? How old were you when you had your... I think I was probably a sophomore as well. I remember uh, it was summertime and I was over at my friend's house and um, I remember taking a couple of beers out of my dad's refrigerator. And, you know, I thought I was being so clever because I took the beers from the back, you know, like, <laughs> like it really made a difference, you know, like I was like, oh, I'm going to just reach and take the ones from the very back. And I took them and it was like Paps Blue Ribbon and it was just terrible. It was just <laughs> terrible. That did not convince me to drink beer whatsoever. Um, I did later on discover Boone's Farm and things like that, that I, I enjoyed, but yeah. Yeah, we did, we drank Strawberry Hill. That was our oh, Boone's Farm. Absolutely, yeah. that was the yes, one we drank yeah. too because it was sweet. Yeah, it was fun. I feel like yeah. that was maybe my that was maybe my second week in college. <laughs> Strawberry. Yeah, <laughs> the first is peach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice to make sure you had friends that were of age that could buy the bottles, you know, and make and have it. But so, where where did you attend university, Ellen? Um, I went to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Okay. Champaign, um, okay. Which. I don't know if this is still the case, but uh, the bar age for entry was 19. So if you had an early birthday in your freshman year, you could go to the bars. Technically, yeah. you couldn't buy anything, but that was never an issue. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think it's the same anymore. I think it's 21 all across the board. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I, I, that sort of, that changed in um, uh, in Mississippi b- before I had gotten there and moved up to 21. But prior to that, it was uh, like 19. So there were some, mm-hmm. there were some like, you know, uh, juniors in college who had been drinking, <laughs> who had been legal. And then they're <laughs> like, wait, you're not, le- I'm not legal now. But we, when we arrived, it was, it, you had to be 21. So um, awesome. Well, let's just like get into the meat of, um, you know, what we're, what we had, El- what we have Ellen on talk about. Um I, I've you know done some reading and some. Uh, I was not. I did. I was not able to bring myself to watch another episode of Mrs. America. Have you seen it yet, Ellen? I did. I watched two episodes last night, and I really okay. enjoyed it. I was surprised. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Emily, did you get a chance? to I see haven't. It? No, I'm having a hard time. Also, like I, I, I mean, I love Kate Blanchett, so I think it'd be really interesting to you know, to see her play this role, I would be very curious to, to learn how she feels about playing this role. Cause she's, you know, she's done some adventurous things that are maybe a little more liberal. And so, um, I you can imagine it's a fascinating character to try and portray, but, um, I, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just, I'm afraid to, um, I'm just afraid that I'm going to be frustrated and angry. I, I hear you on that. And I've really like tried to think like, what is it that bothers me the most? You know, because I, I, I was like, why am I, why am I so repulsed? You know, was it because the the show is ma- is pre- presenting Phyllis in kind of you know a little bit of humanity with her? Like you know, I could the the scenes in the first episode in her home life, you know how her husband treats her and how how the 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 male and the congressional and senatorial delegation like just discarded her. And then my thought was like, if she had just been listened to, maybe as a woman maybe she wouldn't have gotten so angry and then grab, you know, grabbed onto the ERA and to stop the ERA, because I think that was a grab for power for herself. Mm. That's my, that's my thought. Um, and then of course we know that the ERA is still not in, has not been ratified by all 50 States. Um, so, so then like when Ellen responded that she had met Phyllis and from being in the college conservatives, I was like, I have to talk to you about what that experience is. And so you've watched a couple of the episodes. How much does it align with things that you were told or or give us, or maybe we'll back up a little bit. Give us a little history on how you became involved with the College Conservatives at Urbana. Sure. Um, well, I entered uh, U of I as a conservative. I remember going to... Um, a college Republicans meeting, maybe my first or second week, picking up a sign at the activities table, which really horrified my college roommate. And she had good reason to be horrified. But um, 
I what did the you know, sign say? It was just a uh, oh, it was a large elephant, and it said "Republicans Unite for Victory." Okay, okay. And I never actually joined the college Republicans. Um, I laid low for a little bit, then realized that um, some people I was I was already good friends with were in charge of the conservative newspaper on campus, the Orange and Blue Observer. And I needed some copy editing experience for rounding out my resume um, because I wanted to go into publishing. So I thought that was a good opportunity. And I liked the fact that I would have a lot of control as copy editor. <laughs> and um, I part of, being in, part of being on the newspaper was that uh, we were sent on a couple of I don't want to say junkets, but they were paid by, paid for by sponsors. I'm not sure exactly who, kind of of the Heritage Foundation type, the people who are very invested in, in producing young conservatives on campus, the next generation. Okay. Um, and that is how I briefly met Phyllis Schlafly, which was at a conference for uh, regional college conservatives in um, St. Louis. At the I, at the hotel, what I think it used to be called the Millennium, the round one. The restaurant. Oh, the yeah, yes. yeah, the yeah. Riverfront, yeah, were, the Millennium Hotel. Were you were you aware of who she was? And I was, yeah. yeah. And yeah. were you were did you admire her? Like, what was your what was your feeling about her at that well, time in your life? I did admire her. Um, partly, I will say, in retrospect, being a Midwesterner and meeting very few celebrities, here was an opportunity. But, um, but she, certainly she was admired among the, among the young conservative women set for what she had accomplished. And so, so um, let me ask you that. Did what she had accomplished, like stopping the ERA or the methods that she used to accomplish whatever her goal was? Both. 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 So you recognize that? Yes, the, the grassroots efforts that she had been able to, to lead to to block the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah. Um, so did you not want equal rights? I think that at this time in the nine, this was, I was in college from 1995 to 99. And it was a very different time. Um, I would say that there were a lot of stereotypes on campus and in the general media, thanks Rush Limbaugh, for um, promoting feminazis, uh -huh. the movie PCU, which you know cast liberal women in a certain light. Um, I did. I like Phyllis uh, Schlafly in Mrs. America. She really played on the "don't want to be drafted." Now there was nothing that I was going to be drafted for, mm -hmm. but um, I noticed that. A lot of a lot of men responded favorably when I would say say when I would speak conservative lingo. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking today too about even when I was in college, how um, I was and I was in uh, college eighty seven to ninety two, and um, and then masters after that, but undergrad that I was afraid to say that I was a feminist or, mm -hmm. you know, and I believed in feminism. I always said, oh, I'm a humanist. I believe right. in things for humans. And I, and I think about how, if, you know, and I, you know, here we have this podcast clearly speaking, we're like, you know, um, you know just short of burning our bras, uh, but how easily manipulated I was in, or, or um, not, not, not manipulated, uh, tempered and mm -hmm. just kind of just, you know, keeping my voice down so not to upset other people. Exactly. I th I think, honestly, I think for me, feminist, the word itself has had such a negative connotation attached to it for, you know, uh, from my perspective, unfortunately, you know, and I think it's because Ellen, like you, I, I you know, I grew up in a conservative town and mm -hmm. Um, and so my, my feeling of what I thought a feminist was, was more closely aligned with what you're talking about, the PCU, these like really 
feminazis like you were talking about, you know, and it less about equal rights, uh, more about radicalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think it's a real unfortunate misunderstanding about, about what feminism really is. Or is it an intentional, is it an intentional mis, uh, representation, right? It's, it's, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't where, oh, we just, we just misunderstood. It was, the message was that it was radical, that it was bad, that it was, you know, man hating, um, mm-hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things when, when really feminine, I read a book, um, Bell Hooks, she's another one of my favorite authors. Uh, she wrote a book called Feminism is for Everybody. And the premise in her book is like, you know, if you provide these equal rights and provide, you know, no, no discrimination based on sex, then everybody rises because then women have more opportunities. Women can do these, you know, women can have their jobs and they can get paid equally. The the family unit gets better, you know, I mean, but that's not how it's presented, you know, back then. And are we, and I was worried. I was so, I think I was so worried that this show, Mrs. America would glorify Phyllis's ideology. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's why I haven't watched any more yet than the first episode, because I don't, because it was 50 years ago, right? Yeah, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Emily. I was going to say, I think another aspect of it, um, beyond what you said, I agree with you, Michelle, um, but I, I think there's also a little bit of this like St. Louis pride. Like I love, I love St. Louis. I love the city and just how. I think um, her understanding her impact here and mm-hmm. locally, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm a, I'm a little worried about what it might do to my St. Louis pride. <laughs> well, I think you can still be proud of St. Louis, Emily. It's yeah. what, uh, what's interesting about St. Louis and um, Ellen, please j- jump in with, you know, sure. the historical knowledge that you have, you know, we have, we have such a di- like extreme history, right? We've got the Dred Scott decision that happened at the, you know, at our courthouse here, which um, that did not allow for, you know, uh, was very instrumental in like really having the civil war happen. So you have that. We Mm -hmm. also had Elijah Lovejoy, who was an abolitionist and was writing fervently against slavery, who was then chased out of St. Louis by the, you know, the angry mobs and the torch and, and moved to Alton, Illinois, which is weird because that's where Phyllis is from mm-hmm. or Phyllis, Phyllis lived. Um, and he was eventually murdered uh, in Alton, Illinois. Uh, but his writings, he, he died when he was in his early thirties, but his writings went on to influence Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. So then you have, um, you know, we have like really amazing things happen here in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And then we, and then we have like, we're, we're like on both sides, you know, right. we're like playing, we're playing Very polarizing. Both, we're playing both cards. We would yes. have, we're, we're trying to appease everybody. Yes. You yeah. know? So I don't know necessarily, sh- I know I'm, I'm not proud that Phyllis Schlafly is from this area. I would prefer that she was from someplace else. <laughs> right. You know, um, I don't even like going to the tap room. I don't like going to the, you know, the, the place in Maplewood, you know, cause it's which a I, family. Right. Which I believe is run by her nephew by marriage who despises her. Right. Right. So, you know, yeah. But, but they, still. yeah, but they, they still have the, uh, the Eagle forum, you know, which yes. was, which there's a great article in, um, I think it's USA Today. I sent it both to both yes. of you guys. Mm-hmm. I will um, post it on <laughs> our website with this episode, um, a perspective on the uh, on uh, the Eagle Forum and the right wing, the complete and total right wing, like extreme thoughts that mm-hmm. that Phyllis was was championing back then. That pe- that the Republican Party thought she was batshit crazy. Mm-hmm. And now, and now that's, that's what they believe. That's what yeah. they believe, you know? Um, so it's, <laughs> it's hard. And it's really hard when you're like, and help me and help me through this. Why, why do some, and I'm going to say women, cause I, you know, let's, cause we're talking about women. Why is it easy for some women to, um, to, to actively do things to keep other women down. Why is it like, you know, I'm thinking about like the, the stop ERA folks, Mm -hmm. 
you know? Yeah. Just well, curious. I think it props them up as an individual. Um, yeah. Watching watching Mrs. America, that's one thing that struck me. Um, I wouldn't say that that um, Kate Blanchett's portrayal was necessarily sympathetic, but you definitely sensed her anger at being shut out of conversations, at not being at no one listening to her her real expertise on um, on Soviet relations. And she found something that people were willing to listen to, and it allowed her to to use the skills that she had developed and actually show take leadership, grab power, to grab power in a way yeah. that was that is completely sanctioned. Right. Yeah, right. I think you know, knowing that um, you know that the opportunity for women has not been equal. And mm-hmm. so, you know, women, women in the workplace, women are just all across, right. Women in going to school, like all, all of these things, having a more, a equal opportunity is relatively new. If you look at, you know, our history. And so because of that, because the opportunities are few in relationship, that means that we're all vying for the same the same one opportunity. Right. So you know, which 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 yields to competition and just mm-hmm. all of that. So I think that that definitely makes it more complicated for women to lift and support one another. Now, I've seen that dynamically shift since you know, in the last 10 years, I've seen a huge shift with that. But I also don't know if I've seen that shift because one, I've been very proactively surrounding myself with other women who want to lift and support other women. Mm -hmm. But or also, you know, I've made a huge change from leaving a conservative town and moving here to St. Louis, which, you know, is is far more diverse. And um, so I don't know if it's it's just me being more open to it and seeing it, or if times have really drastically changed in the last 10 years. And so I'm seeing more, more of that kind of behavior of women banding together. I think times have absolutely changed um, in the last 10 years, looking back the last 20 years. When I think about the culture that of the early to mid nineties, um, the Susan Faludi backlash culture which, you know, as a college conservative, I kind of laughed at, but it was completely dead on accurate. Um, that, was, that was a reaction to misogyny in the 80s, continuing on into the 90s. And then at some point, this is around the time that I started identifying as a liberal. And I would say it was a little bit after September 11th. Mm. And this was... At this point, I think conservatism became twisted into nationalism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, sometimes I and I've said this on the show before. You know, I, I, I miss the intelligent talk. I miss the intelligence that used to like used to be present in both. You know, in the Republican side, it's like I can understand. It's like okay, if you're going to vote going to vote Republican, you know, that they have, you know, those are awesome ideals. And, but, you know, they're, the, the people are not out actively to, to harm somebody else and to right. shut somebody else down. And that has, that's sort of, that to me, that's changed over, it's, over the last, uh, at least the last, um, uh, definitely during the Trump administration, but well, it was festering, yeah. it was festering before because, yeah. You know, there was, there was, you know, th- that, but that's how they do it. They stoke it and mm-hmm. they, and they, and they continue to push those. I mean, I blame Rush Limbaugh and I, yes. and I, I blame the, uh, the, the, um, repeal of the, um, fair and balanced act of the FCC and mm-hmm. the holding news organizations accountable for providing truly both sides, uh, airtime for both sides. And that, mm-hmm. that led the way for, um, Fox news to be able to become a channel, a, a broadcast channel, um, mm-hmm. in the United States. So, oh my God. I, I think so that I would think, be, that yeah, would be I mean, you, you, <laughs> you did bring Reagan something up. up there, Michelle, um, you mm-hmm. know, Trump, you know, I think Trump coming into power, you know, the, the grab him by the pussy, all of that kind of, you know, garbage that has come out of, 
out of him and his administration, I think that has fostered more of a movement for women coming together. Yes. And, um, and then of course, Me Too. Yes. Me Too is definitely, I think, um, a reaction to Trump, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, and, and it was like, um, uh, when he was elected, and of course, you know, we, we're not, we don't want to continue to rehash that, but it was like, it didn't matter, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, like, Phyllis Schlafly, the depiction of her in that meeting um, mm-hmm. in the first episode when uh, they dismiss the secretary and they, it's because they don't want anything on record. But when all the um, the senators, and I think she was in there with Barry Goldwater, they're supposed mm-hmm. to be talking about the SALT treaty or something like that. So they dismiss the secretary. No, we're not going to have uh, any record of this. She leaves. And then they say to Phyllis, but it's okay. We would like for you to take notes. Right. And, um, and so-and-so will give you a pen. Mm -hmm. So as the woman in the room, you were going to be taking notes. So it was like, you were, you really were irrelevant. Didn't matter if you had ideas, Mm -hmm. you know? So when, you know, fast forward to 2016 with him being, um, you know, put into office, it was like a, you really are irrelevant. Yes. Everything about your concerns uh, are irrelevant and, and that's just continued. It didn't matter what color skin you were, you know, unless you're a white male who has a, you know, um, a membership to Mar-a-Lago or you are, you know, um, connected with, you know, Putin and people like that, (laughs) you know, Um, and that's unfortunate, but I think Phyllis Schlafly would be, super proud of the policies and the ideologies that are present in the White House right now. I mean, I can just imagine her like on the sides at the Women's March saying Mm -hmm. nasty things into her microphone because that's what that article that you posted from USA Today, Michelle, that mentioned like she was very pithy and she had scathing comments. I remember that from the two times that I saw her speak and met her um, in person that she, she was cruel and, and she was good at it. Whoa. She's calculating. She was, it was you completely know? calculated. And, you, and I think that in the Mrs. America series, again, I've only seen the first two episodes, but you can see that, that calculation working. And mm-hmm. it's like a perversion of her abilities, in my opinion, what she could have been doing with it, but right. she went right. this route instead. Right. And one of the things I read um, is that one of her favorite lines that she would say to, and she would knew she said it, I'm sure she believed it, but she, she would say this whenever she gave a public speak, spe- a speech or, you know, engagement, um, because she knew it really just got under the skin yes. of the other women was that the, her very first line was always something along the lines of, first of all, I'd like to thank my husband, John, right. if that was uh, his name, um, for allowing me to be here today to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I don't remember that, but I do remember, um, like the second time that I would have met her, it was, um, it was, I think possibly like the day before Halloween at, on campus. And she made a comment about all the witches being out and all the, and it's Halloween. So the freaks have come out, the freak feminists have come out in full force. Wow. It was timed and it was, and, you know, of course we, we laughed and the women, the feminists in the back jeered and, um, but again, it was, it was cold and it was calculated and it was, it was effective. Yeah. And looking back, do you, um, can you see the, the, the grooming and how it took place? I mean, I'm, I'm, oh, I, yes. I'm, I'm using the words grooming, but, um, that everything was methodical from the, the, the things that they had you read or Certainly. what they ex- exposed you to. Could you share a little bit more? Sure. Um, One thing was that an organization that I belong to, and I'm not, again, I'm not really sure where the money was flowing for a lot of these things, but I started receiving every month um, a couple of very, very large, very dry, and usually very boring books in the mail, um, enough to eventually fill up a small bookcase sent by a group much like Young America Foundation or the Heritage Foundation. And they were, you know, books like the Federalist Papers, books on tax policy, books that, 
encourage you to think obviously a certain way. The, a couple, uh, three times I went to a different conference or to a workshop. The first one was in Washington, DC and everyone who worked on our newspaper got to go there. Again, not sure who paid for it, but it was, you know, we stayed in a dorm in DC run by this company or this organization, um, a lobbyist group, a think tank, and they were preoccupied with churning out college conservatives. So we had workshops on how to, basically how to raise hell on campus, how to call out professors who are overly liberal, how, mm. to, how to take a stand as we saw it. Mm. So like take a stand and, but it was, sounds like it's targeting. Sure. It was like, um, I would say that this was again in the late nineties, a very, a very big issue was affirmative action. I was looking through my old, um, observer newspapers and I see how much there was about affirmative action in that. And, um, so there was a lot of preoccupation, you know, veiled Mm -hmm. racism, Mm-hmm. on the part of these lobby groups to, to help us sniff out small instances of, you know, for example, a cultural house on campus getting being paid for by the university. Oh my gosh. So we would <laughs> report on that hmm. as hmm. unfair. To the other house that wasn't yes. being supported by the yes. university. Um, did you, looking back, do you feel like, all of the messages that you uh, wrote on as, you know, as, as your, at your mm-hmm. publication were dictated from outside the university. I mean, you know, I think about my student newspaper, you know, we talked, you know, there would be things about, you know, the administration and the, you know, the, the closing of this cafe or, you know, I mean, but it wasn't, it definitely was just an overall student newspaper. It wasn't a bent um, um, towards a, an ideology but I was just wondering. It was geared towards campus. It was, it was um, almost entirely issues that were um, happening on campus or ways that we thought we should be uh, responding to it. Okay. Uh, You shared with us on our, on our chat earlier, you have a, you have a cover about one of the articles that you wrote um, about title nine. Yes. uh, if you could show that on our video and then just read the um, read your headline. Yes, I'll and, try uh, to find it. Just a minute. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and Title Nine, forgive me if I've got this wrong. That's to it was to create equality in sports for women in um, in college. So if they have a big football team that's male, then they need to provide equal funding for women's sports. Correct? I think that's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I cannot find that particular issue, but I do have a couple of other ones. This is okay. yeah. like the new face of feminism. So um, this woman is holding, um, I don't know what she is wearing here. It's like a half pantsuit or not pantsuit, but a half skirt and suit. And then some, oh, look, she's braless. I just noticed oh, that. Wow. And yeah. she has a sign that says, hey, hey, yada, yada. And conservative women offer new vision for modern feminism. And wow. I, okay. um, I know I contributed at least one article to that. Yeah. And um, I want to emphasize that the Republican Party, even though I didn't feel that we operated as Republicans, in fact, we shared an office for a while with the college Republicans and sort of did not like them because we thought they were sellouts. They did not care enough about policy. Um, but at this time in the late 90s, the, the Republican Party was on this big tent idea, this idea that we could have a large, any number of groups that, um, that we could have immigrants who own small businesses, that we could have the log cabin Republicans, the gay Republicans. Um, it was, it was a, they were actually reaching out and trying to, trying to be more diverse. Back then. Back then. And also to prove that they were not taking these groups for granted, which is something you still hear from right. from conservative Republicans today too, that the Democrats do not 
do not actually do anything, but instead just take these groups for granted. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think even Trump used it in one of his campaign talks. Right. It's like, you know, what have they done for you? Right. Well, to, you need to you need to vote for uh, vote for me because I mean they haven't right. done anything for you. Right. So that was just um, you know taking that idea and uh, and simplifying it down to you know a soundbite. Yes. So what happened then? Because they're very you know if you aren't the uh, it appears what you know we're seeing in the in the media uh, today and uh, around us is that it appears that um, they don't want anybody that's not like them. I think. September 11th happened. I think um, a tremendous immigrant backlash started right around that time. Um, I think they abandoned the concept of of diversity and um, certainly abandoned this this big tent philosophy that had that had governed the late 90s. How does it make you feel when you're watching um, Phyllis uh, in, you know, in Mrs. America and uh, you're a mother of two daughters, correct? Yes, I am. <laughs> two extremely feminist uh, 11 year old girls. And, you know, knowing the, the, the time that you spent um, working, you know, you're younger, yes. how, like what, what would you want like how, if you could change things, how would you change things? What would you want for your daughters? For my daughters, I would, yeah. I would want this Republican nationalism gone. I would want safe schools for them. Yeah. And I would want them to be respected as individuals, which is the kind of thing that I would say as a, college conservative in the in the um the late 90s but now i see that that the republicans are very and conservatives are very happy to push women into into small groups and to deny them a voice i don't want them to be i don't want them to be afraid to say this is wrong and i want them to know an effective way of going about it right yeah. Let's take a quick break. And we're back. Got a little bit more wine. Yes. Drank a little water. Everybody's got some fresh glasses going, correct? Mm-hmm. You know, we dealt with a little dealt with a little internet connectivity, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. podcasting in the era of uh of uh COVID. COVID. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's a little bit, uh, it's not as nice as when we're sitting there in the studio, you know. I know. Um, I know. I'm thankful we have, you know, we've, we've got a pretty good system figured out, but it's, it's not the same. Yeah. For sure. and, thank, and thankfully we have our great audio engineer, Sam Mall, yeah. guiding us uh, through, through this wonderful uh, recording time. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> Back to Phyllis Schlafly, Mrs. America, things at the ERA. Uh, one of the uh, things that I had read about the um, the targeted uh, uh, campaign against um, Gloria Steinem at the same time, you know, she started Ms. Magazine, mm-hmm. uh, right. you know, uh, some, uh, I, I, there's a lot of the things that I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I do not try to pretend that I am, you know, a hundred percent versed in feminist history. And I love for anybody who has some cool places for us to go look, study, read, you know, feel free to send that to us on an email or our message us on our Facebook page. It's totally fine. But I was reading and I, I believe it was the, um, it might've been the USA today, but it could have been the Vanity Fair article I read today that one of the tactics that they used to target Gloria Steinem um, was this porn magazine screwed, put put this full page ad in about the um, uh, ERA and Ms. Magazine and um, published Gloria's phone number. Whoa. So she would, oh, she, wow. Yeah. So she started getting phone calls like the very next day with men saying, so will you suck my dick? Will you lick my oh, balls? Wow. I mean, talk about like targeted harassment and it's they cold. also- they also had a picture of her, they had a picture of her face. Um, that's what she said. She goes right outside our offices was that magazine screwed, 
And in the centerfold, it was pin the tail on the feminist, but or sorry, oh. pin pin the cock on the feminist, and it was had her oh. face and all of these different penises, and that you played this game and you like to put it in her mouth oh wherever you wanted God. to do it. Wow, isn't that awful? That's, that's awful. so hateful, hateful. And that's that's the you know that's the part I, I you know um, what. Are, and we've said this before, what are they afraid of if women, you know, gain equality? And it's not necessarily, you know, we just, I mean, here I am using those words, not necessarily um, qualifying, right? Taking the edge mm-hmm. off. But that amendment was about not allowing discrimination on the basis of sex. Right. You know, and when they're like, well, you you could get this, oh, you could get drafted. Um, you could no longer have access to alimony for the rest of your life mm-hmm. if you do get divorced. And that, um, and that uh, she wanted, uh, one of the things Phil said, and I'm paraphrasing, was that women needed to preserve that, um, that special thing that we have as women for the ability to be taken care of of our husbands. I mean, we didn't have to actually go out and work and be forced to work. But, you know, if the ERA passed, you could be forced to work. So let's fast forward 50 years. Women are having to work yes. because many of us can't afford to have a single income household. I know countless women who've gotten divorced and alimony is lasts five years. It doesn't last forever, right? Um, and even those who like get the the alimony until they marry or until you know the ex husband dies, those husbands, those exes, can petition back of the court, have it re evaluated, and alimony can go away. So mm-hmm. the ERA has not passed, but the position of women has been affected yes. negatively. Right. Yes. We are not earning the same for the same work. Um, and one of the things that the Eagle Forum I saw on their page today, one of the um, the tax policies that they really push is that the tax break should be greater. The tax deduction should be greater for um, uh, married families, you know, contemporary Christian families, uh, male women with children. Those that they should have a greater tax break, uh, tax credit than a single person with children. Oh, uh, wow! A family with children because they are anti, they are anti anti um, uh, LGBTQ as well. Right. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm on a rant. I did a lot of I did a lot of reading today. No, <laughs> Feel free to chime mm. in at any time. Anybody mm. can, can answer, can um, an ad. Uh, the other thing that I saw when it was about like what. That what states have not ratified the ERA, and uh, there are twelve states who um, who still have not ratified it. And the last state to ratify it was Illinois in twenty eighteen. Mm-hmm. Seriously, so, that recently? That recently, they finally That's ratified staggering. it in twenty eighteen. But are you guys so, ready? Ready for the yeah. list? Yes. Okay, um, and I'm sure that this. I mean, you might be surprised, but probably not. All right. Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, North Mm. Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Louisiana, Utah, Mississippi, and Missouri. Of course. Oh. So I'm not... I'm, I would say I'm not surprised with the exception of Arizona. Like for some reason I would, would have thought that they'd be a little more progressive. No, I think they've always been fairly conservative, yeah. a little bit more money to say than New Mexico mm-hmm. and uh, responding to the, the heathens over the border in California. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Ha. Huh. Yeah, wow. So 12 states. 12 states. Which, if you overlaid it with a map of the COVID stay-at-home orders, would probably look very similar. <laughs> Isn't that an, an yeah. interesting concept? <laughs> like who are like uh, eliminating the, most, the yeah, yeah, they're the predictable states. Yes, yes. Um, the other thing um, that I read today, and this is something for us to think about, and I wanted to, I'm glad we're recording so I wouldn't forget it. I think I saw it on Twitter. And it was um, somebody that made a comment about the 
the good the the nuclear family right that how they think about that the the 1950s and how that's you know some kind of ideal right and how mm-hmm. how a woman took care of the home and you know and it was just that you know leave it to beaver right mm-hmm. and somebody had you know had said or on twitter made the statement that in the 1950s women were being taught how to keep their house and keep it nice so as to avoid their husbands beating them oh as a God. result of PTSD from the wars that they had been in. So it wasn't about, I mean, it was, it's basically, it was a survival. Yeah. You know, wow. keep yeah. everything nice and easy and, and calm. Peaceful. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't, Peaceful. Eat, so he doesn't get triggered, yes. you know, the, you know, shell shock or the PTSD, we call it now. Keep and, it too wow. quiet so he doesn't somehow think that link it to the war. Right. That's um, wild. Like, like having the kids bathed and fed is somehow going to prevent nighttime bombs from going off. Right. And it's, right. Yeah. And it was all again, you know, not necessarily they didn't treat the shell shock. They didn't, they didn't treat PTSD then. It was just as women, you, you dealt with it. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, that is, you know, it's so interesting when you look at you know, times and history and understand how these kind of social practices, where they really came from, you know, mm-hmm. that's just amazing. And, you know, the 1950s was such an outlier in the history of the world. And it's painful that that conservatives and Republicans keep going back to that as an ideal. It mm-hmm. wasn't like any other time, and it's not going to happen again. And it wasn't so wonderful Mm-mm. as first, you know, women could not, um, as in the first episode of Mrs. America, this is in the late 60s, early 70s, and Phyllis Schlafly has her husband sign off on her credit card application so she can right. make a purchase at Marshall Fields. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, my mom. Well, I, I bought a car myself before my mom did, but you know, mm. um, all the other time it was, she had to, my dad had to be on it. Mm-hmm. And I bought my first car in 1991. My mother didn't buy her own car under her name without my dad involved at all, even though they were married until 1993. Wow. You know, yeah. it's, you know, I bet my mom has never bought a car under her name hmm. just because my dad likes buying cars. I do want to circle back to that, but, you know, it, it, it kind of to, just to chase up what you're, we're talking about with the fifties, you know, there's, there's, you know, obviously there's the issues with, with, um, rights for women, but think about African-Americans yes. and you know, civil rights. I mean, there's lots of deeper issues that yes. affect so many more people when you come layer all of those on yes. top of what other, you know. Yes. And this in the 60s, the immigration rate was as low as, as it has ever been. And it is no wonder. I think that every time I see a comment from a relative or an, an older person, especially on Facebook, and I think your world doesn't look like it did when you were young and you have to get over that. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, I, clearly it seems that you were brought up with these conservative ideas. Um, is that correct? Or is your, are your, is your family more conservative in nature? I would definitely say they're more conservative in nature. Um, at the same time, I wouldn't say that, that my dad was, was talking, talking about it a lot. Um, I felt influenced by it. I was thinking about this too, and that, um, as, as an intelligent girl in a small town in the Midwest, the, my only liberal outlets in the early nineties were Sassy Magazine, which was wonderful. <laughs> and, um, also MTV and a little bit of uh, cable TV. So I did not have a lot of, a lot of outside influences. I did not have a lot of representation of what it, what it would be to be a, a healthy and balanced feminist. Mm-hmm. And I stress mm-hmm. balance because that's really a term that the unbalanced, the unhinged was a, the ideology that was thrown around a lot in the mm-hmm. early 90s. Yeah. But yeah, my dad listened to Rush Limbaugh. Um, I remember having a 
going up to to visit a boyfriend my junior year in high school and his riding up with his dad um, for some for some reason just you know ride to his house and his dad was listening to Rush Limbaugh and I thought I would die if anyone was listening to that in front of my daughters. I think I was going through like a little bit of a liberal phase at the time because I remember arguing with him, which did not make him like me anymore. (laughs) Yeah. I, I have a really interesting experience arguing with, um, not an adult, but somebody who is a few years older than I was. Um, so do either of you know the name Matt Hale? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, he went to my high school and, uh, you know, he is definitely a leader or was a leader of a, um, you know, a white supremacy group. Wow. And I, uh, I got in a, I got in a pretty hardcore argument with him (laughs) Mm -hmm. at one point because we both, he was a violinist and (laughs) we both had a gig together and, uh, I mean, it was, it was astounding to me, the kinds of things that he was saying and how he thought about things. Um, he's in prison now. Uh, yeah, he, I I believe it was, um, um, on a attempted murder account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, oh my God, I just, you know, those, real extreme ideas. I, I, I never quite understand how somebody can be so far down a path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think we talked a little bit last time when we were out, you know, not on the recording was about fear and and how the fear is used and of the other person, fear Mm -hmm. that your livelihood is going to be taken away, fear Mm -hmm. that they're going to come and take your house, fear of, you know, the world as you are comfortable in is going to change and, and you'll you know, never be the same. And so the fear that you're going to be drafted. Yes. Uh, the, yeah. the other thing was that there was a fear that they were going to have unisex bathrooms, fear that it was going to make homosexuality. Okay. It was like all of these things were tied <laughs> into their, the against ERA. Um, and, and it's like, how, how do you combat somebody's fear? You know, other than, you know, how, in addition to conversation, in addition knowledge. to knowledge, yeah, yeah, knowledge, and, and sometimes that knowledge has to be you get you get the hell out of where you are. You move to another city. You live among people who are not like you. You learn to open your mind. You learn that poor people are not bad. That they're right. not going to drag you down. Mm-hmm. That that minorities are dealing with things that you've never even thought about. You learn right. to check your privilege. And yeah. I do think that I do think that that is very hard to do unless you relocate. Mm-hmm. Right. Because other perspectives. Changed. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it's I didn't move to St. Louis after college because I wanted to get away from my family. I'm very close to my family. But this is where the opportunity was. And it was a city unlike anything that I had ever. It was a place I had never. It was a place unlike anything I'd ever lived in. And it's wonderful. And I feel I am so much more of a better person for, mm-hmm. for this, for the last 20 years of living here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. You know, I, I definitely like you. Um, I, I had different thoughts about things, um, mm-hmm. you know, not too long ago, really, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, um, I feel very fortunate to have been able to become exposed to a wider breadth of life and circumstances. And, um, it's really, yeah, I, I just, I'm so much more open than I've ever been and, um, understanding and, um, and yeah, it comes down to exposure and, it does. and, and diving into it and not being afraid of it. Right. And when I say, that I feel that I'm a better person for this. I want to say that I I want to emphasize that I feel that I am more caring and aware of other people and that I'm not assuming that everyone is like me Mm -hmm. or that my way of being brought up or that my way of being is better than someone else's in a small homogenous town. It is, it is impossible to get to that point. I feel, um, 
I remember in high school, there were, there were maybe, this was a, a town, a large enough small town. And there were, I think a thousand kids in our high school, a good size for yeah. a small town area. And it was, it's a very privileged bedroom community community. And I want to say that maybe, maybe 10 minority students in the entire, the entire high school. And, um, one, one guy, a black guy was on the football team. And I think my senior year, there was a shirt that said like top 10 things overheard at a fill in the blank town football game. And, um, on the back of the t-shirt was, no, he's just really tan. No, I'm serious. Oh. I'm serious. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's just so reprehensible. Like what? And you know, did anyone did anyone stop to ask him what he thought about that? And if they did, did he did he laugh it off? I'm on, I'm a Facebook friend with him now, and he doesn't laugh things off. He pushes back. Yeah. Yeah. Is he still in the town, or did he get out too? I'm not sure. Okay. But but yeah. he does push back, and he calls out about called out people from high school and saying, you know what? I didn't speak up then, but I'm speaking up now. Mm. And this is something you said, and this is how it made me feel. Well, I think when you said we need to check our privilege, Mm -hmm. you know, check our privilege Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, the, (laughs) even this COVID times, you know, um, our, how we experience it is completely different than other people are experiencing it. Right. You know, we have Even jobs. from one from one neighborhood to another in the city. With one one house to the next in the yes. city, you know, in the yeah. city, you know, because the, of of the of the livelihoods of the age of the of your health status, things like that. Um, it's pretty it's pretty apparent. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you know to wrap up the the podcast today. What I would like you know um, would love to hear from our uh, our listeners who've list, who've watched Mrs. America. You know, please send us an email. Um, and uh, let us know what you think. But I also want to like challenge everybody to, to research more than what is presented in Mrs. America, go deep on the biographies of all of the women in Mm -hmm. the, who worked in the ERA movement and, and, you know, uh, look for the, look for what, what was a big barrier, you know, um, let's, you know, could we get this thing passed in the next 50 years? I mean, we, we're just, we're just 12, we're just 12 states shy, you know? Um, but I think, you know, educate yourself. Don't just take this, this presentation of an aspect of the ERA movement and what we were trying, they were trying to do in the early seventies. Um, don't think that the privileges that you have, that you experience as women, don't take those for granted because mm-hmm. the way things are going, those things could go right. away too. Yes. You know, um, anybody else have anything to add? Um, I do actually have a book recommendation. Something oh, fantastic. Fairly fundamental to me. Um, it's called the mommy myth and it was published in the early aughts. Um, and it talks a lot about in a very accessible way about the about how the Equal Rights Amendment was brought down. That's just the beginning of it. Um, how feminist feminism got this label that it did not did not deserve and that was not reflective of of its actuality. And then progressing on through the 80s, 90s, into the early aughts to see to see the backlash that really was existing. It's funny oh. and it's frank, and um, you can probably find a used copy on Amazon or eBay. Okay, or at, the library. or at your local bookstore if you're lucky. Yeah, and what is the, the book? It's called the Mommy Myth. Oh, the Mommy. Oh, it, looks like, it looks like my daughter's Drew, and it's <laughs> uh, the idealization of motherhood and how it has undermined women. And although it is wow, it is very targeted towards motherhood, it is instructive from a feminist standpoint. The authors are Susan J. Douglas and Meredith W. Michaels, and it was published in 2004. Okay, okay. well, Excellent. thank you for sharing Excellent. that. I definitely look forward to looking that up. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you so thank much, you. Ellen, for coming yeah. on the show. Thank you for and, having uh, me. Yeah, we'll do this really again. Delightful. This is um, fun. Chit chat on the on the back patio, hopefully soon. Yes. Um, but yeah, definitely t- take care and all of you out there in listener land, take care of yourselves. Everybody yeah. stay healthy, drink your wine, and uh and and just 
love each other. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting a little sappy. Yes. You can tell that this cabaret is a little bit. Yeah. All right. Yeah, All cheers. right. Cheers. 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 cheers.